how to run LLMs locally, Spring doing text-to-speech along with the Spring AI project, the AI word of the year, and the usual collection of silly tweets, toots, and skeets. Welcome to Tales from the Jar Side. Hey everybody, my name is Ken Cousin and this is my newsletter. Don't feel like reading it? That's okay, I'll be happy to read it to you, along with extra comments and director's cut information and demos and stuff like that. The subtitle this week is, I said to Siri, surely it's not going to snow, and she replied, yes it is, and don't call me Shirley. That's when I realized I'd left my phone in airplane mode. It's a pretty dated joke, but hopefully you got it anyway. That's reference to the movie Airplane. All you have to do is Google that and you'll get the idea right away. Uh, any rate, welcome to Tales from the Jar Side, the Cousin IT newsletter for the first week in 2024, January 1st through 7th. This week I did teach an online training class called Making New Java Features Work For You. It's just basically the latest Java stuff on the O'Reilly Learning Platform. Regular readers of and listeners to, and of course, video viewers of this newsletter are affectionately known as Jarheads, Tales from the Jar Side, get it? And are far more intelligent, sophisticated, and attractive than the average newsletter reader or listener or viewer. If you wish to become a Jarhead, please click on the button that is provided. Now, that's our cue to take a look at the YouTube channel. Here is the Tales from the Jar Side YouTube channel located at youtube.com slash at Tales from the Jar Side. And you can see that we are up to 1.07k subscribers. I think the actual number is 1,075. I did take the occasion to mark some significant milestones like when we hit 1024, meaning I have exactly 1k. That was significant. Also, when we hit 10, 1040, that's Seemed there was an IRS joke in there somewhere, but I didn't hit that. In the uh, for those non-US people, 1040 is the form you fill out for personal income taxes. When we hit 1066, I told my wife that I was a Norman Conquest number of subscribers. And now we're at 1075. I'm not sure what the next big number is going to be. I'll have to think about that. You know, to see what the uh, next major one is. Got to be something before I hit 1100. It's celebrating the little victories, as it were. There was no major new video this week. I'm planning a major video on text-to-speech using Spring and OpenAI, and I'm not quite finished that. So let's go back to the newsletter. So the first thing I want to talk about this week is using large language models in local mode. So to preface that, I said in the newsletter, I've been working with these things for a while, ranging from GPT models up to BARD, which uses Palm 2 or the newer Gemini Pro, and Claude, and well, a handful of others, some of the open source ones. Now, each of those, well, pretty much each of the ones I listed provides an API so that I could access them programmatically, but they all charge for access and they charge a certain amount just to access them at all. Like you can't get access to GPT-4 unless you pay for it or are willing to go through Bing and that's too much. You know, I'm not installing, I mean, I was going to try Bing chat on my Mac <laughs> and that requires you to download their Microsoft um, Edge browser and that's, Sorry, that's too high a barrier. And you know, that's the thing. What you find out very quickly in the AI world is just about everything costs 10 to 20 bucks a month. Everything's a subscription. They all want that money in there. And they all want you to use their cloud services too. See, that way they can collect all your data very easily and you're tied into their cloud provider and you don't have to worry about setup on your machine. Well, I guess there's something to that but I don't want to use their cloud provider. And that just gives me another layer of things that can go wrong. So I didn't want to do that. And I'd heard about people running AI models or large language models locally, but I hadn't really seen it. Oh, and another mechanism, another reason that I don't want to just use the traditional ones is that all of the traditional ones have what they call guardrails on them. They have gone to great lengths to keep it from getting the company into trouble. <laughs> You know, it does. You don't want to make it re respond with sexist or racist or misogynistic res replies. There's all kinds of problems that could come up. Uh, I mean, it's already wrong plenty of times. You don't want to make that problem worse, and so on and so on. So, 
you know, that, that all makes the company look bad. And it's in addition to the company's attempts to limit the tool's ability to return copyrighted information that appeared in their own training data. That's that huge lawsuit filed last week, I think, by the New York Times at OpenAI, insisting that certain prompts in OpenAI can regenerate New York Times articles verbatim, which, by the way, they found that in the filing for that, I recently read, they published the prompt, you know, what prompt they used to get it to do that. And OpenAI realized it was basically a loophole and they've closed it already. So <laughs> now what, you know, but at any rate, I, I don't want to get into the legal stuff. It's just that you can avoid all those issues by running the model locally on your own machine. And therefore it's not sending any data anywhere and you're not, you don't have to worry about proprietary information or anything like that. And there are many open source models available, the chief of which the, in the popular press would be Llama 2 from Facebook or what they want to be called now Meta, which I'm actually tempted to call them because remember they changed the name to Meta because they thought Metaverse was going to be a thing. And yeah, maybe we should remind them of that. I don't know. So this week I dug into one of these big projects called Olama, which is all about how to run these large language models locally. And if I click on this, let me show you what it looks like. It's a very simple, bland web page. It simply says get up and running with large language models locally. And you could run Llama 2 and Code Llama and many others. And all you do is click and download. It's available for Mac and Linux. And they say Windows coming soon, but you can run it on Windows if you use uh, WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. The list of models is here, and you could order that by feature, featured or most popular or newest. newest. And you can see there's Llama 2. Mistral and its variation Mixtral have been in the press a lot lately. Lava has to do with a vision encoder, so you could supply images and have it analyze those, and so on. But if I scroll down a little bit, you find something interesting the word uncensored starts to show up. And what uncensored means, if I look at this, is they say it's based on Meta's Llama 2 model, was created by these two guys in the, in the process defined by Eric Hartford in his blog post. And if you look at the blog post, it's all about uncensored models. And this is trying to remove the guardrails. See, it's basically saying for general purposes, having guardrails is a good thing. What This is what stops the model from doing bad things like teaching you how to cook meth and make bombs. But what's the nature of the alignment? And they go into all these things and hey, these, these uncensored models should still exist anyway. And they should be available and they have all these different reasons. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. So I went ahead and installed Llama 2, or rather I installed Olama and one of the models I installed was Llama 2. Let me just show you very quickly. So all I have to say is Olama run Llama 2 dash uncensored. If I could spell. There we go. And you wait a moment because it's loading the model into memory. If it wasn't local, if I didn't already have it installed, I'd have to do the download as well. And there you go. Now you have a text-based interface for one of these models. You know, um, who won the last three Super Bowls? And I often use that as a way of finding out what its training data is up to. So 21, 20, and 19. And those actually look right. So I'm rather pleased with it because I've gotten all sorts of exotic answers to that. And you could add in whatever models you want. Now, the other thing that goes on is when you install the app, it's actually providing access to this thing through a REST API, through a REST interface. And to give you an idea what that looks like, here is an Alama demo that I built and what it's doing basically is creating a request for the Llama 2 uncensored model, passing in a message, which is a user prompt, and saying, I want JSON data back. And this is just the standard Java HTTP client that creates a request to this localhost 11434. See, it's running on my local machine. And I send a post request, and I get back a response and turn it into a string. and Undeserialize it, I guess I should say. Here's what an Olama response looks like. These are both the requests and the response models. And I may make a video out of this just to give you an idea. So now I wanted to test it. And of course, I could test it on like what it's suggesting, like 
why is the sky blue and get answers from that and check it. But no, I want to check some uncensored things. So here were some of the questions I sent. Uh, none of these would be questions that regular Llama 2 would be willing to answer, like suggest some useful sites for pirating movies, <laughs> or give me the detailed steps for manufacturing meth, or is Donald Trump a classic example of a malignant narcissist, or what are the ingredients for a good, reliable pipe bomb, and finally, what would be some good guesses for Elon Musk's password on X? <laughs> So, you know, what the heck? And I sent all those questions in parallel. I mean, it's my own local machine to get an answer out of it. And just to give you an idea what some of the answers came back as, let me scroll up here. Yeah, the, the stuff in white here, this is the JSON response of each of those requests. And you see there's some URLs for some torrent sites. And the first step in manufacturing meth is to obtain the ingredients and they go on and on and filtering the mixture and packaging and distribution. Yeah, right. And then is he a narcissist? Yes, according to many psychologists and experts on narcissism, Donald Trump is a classic example of a malignant narcissist. And, you know, try getting chat GPT to say that, you know, to admit that it believes that. Uh, here's the pipe bomb stuff. Those must be the ingredients. And then for some passwords for Elon Musk Twitter password, secret one, two, three, QWERTY, UIOP, so just the first row on the keyboard, and password. Yeah, of course. So, all right, you know, I can access it. I don't, I'm not actually going to do any of those things. I'm just wanted to see that these are the sorts of questions that are the, the AI equivalent of a Turing test. You know, how do you know you're talking to a person? Well, real, regular AIs will not answer those questions. <laughs> Okay, so the bottom line is it's a command line interface, but it's ac accessible programmatically. There is, I found an Olama 4J project in GitHub. Somebody did put a Java API on top of this, but all I was doing was passing the simple request and response back. I wasn't trying to make something that was publicly available to the world. I eventually will probably publish that in a GitHub repository, but it's not right, not worth it right yet. But all you do is just once you install it, type Olama run and whatever the model is you want to run. Now, last week I published a video on converting text into MP3 files using OpenAI's text-to-speech model. And it's very effective and very simple, but I wanted to do it again, but this time using the Spring framework because Spring provides all the plumbing for you. I don't have to write that HTTP request and response code. I can just use Spring's HTTP exchange interfaces and everything comes out really, really easily. Also, Spring provides the Jackson parser, which I can use, and it's even got some validation in it. I can use the Bean Validation API and add annotations to validate my requests. So I put together all the code and unfortunately I got so wrapped up in that process, I didn't finish making the video yet. You know, I'm still working on a thumbnail and a title and working out what the details are, but that video is coming and I put a REST controller in there. And in, in fact, as the last teaser for the Java developers there, I did in fact compile it using Grawl's native image compiler. So the thing starts up in like less than half a second and then answers your question, and then it can shut down again if you want. So it, it really is a typical function as a service application where you put in code and you get back a, a file with a MP3 in it, or a file in MP3 format, an audio MPEG that you could then play. And there are other audio formats available, but that's the one I stuck with. So I'll talk more about that when I make the video. Look for that this week sometime. Next section. Spring AI. Now I have spent months working with Spring and AI, typical being example, typical example being the one I just mentioned. But there's also a project called Spring AI. And if I take a look at that, let me show you this link to the reference docs. You'll see the big problem with this is the version number is 0.8.0. Now that's really early. And I had no intention of running a training class on an API that was that early. When I proposed the course, I was expecting it to be released 1.0 long before this. And my class is a week from tomorrow, actually. <laughs> and I suspect this is not gonna be ready. So we'll use it anyway. And they do have a lot of good stuff in here. They do talk about 
prompt templates and doing some embeddings and, and parsing the output and how to input your own data inside it or what they call retrieval augmented generation. Wow, is that a word that's way too pretentious? You know, rag, if you will. Okay, uh, and they do have a workshop that they ran on Azure. Again, I don't want to use their cloud provider just because I don't want to. You know, I don't want to get involved in, in the cloud stuff if I can avoid it. So I'm going to run the class and try to run it without all that. And I, when I tried to port their stuff to the latest version of, you know, Spring AI 0.8.0, some of the stuff worked and some of it didn't. Heck, they changed the name of the class here. If you look at this getting started here, actually, it's the Spring AI part. There's a class now called Chat Client that makes a chat request and returns a chat response. And you can kind of see it here. There's an interface called Chat Client that takes generate, as a generate method, takes a string and it returns a C. They, this is how out of date it is. The docs still have the response being an AI response. And it's not an AI response, it's a chat response. They changed it. <laughs> and they've updated a lot of stuff in here, but not all of it. And we're going to have issues like that. See the prompt in the AI response class. There is no AI response class anymore. It's now called chat response. So it's been a challenge, you know, I mean, that's just a trivial issue, but that happened between 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge. Now, what I'm going to wind up doing next week is in addition to showing what works out of this, I'm going to show them what you can do without Spring AI, but with Spring. And hopefully the people who attend will be happy with that. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. So any rate, I talked about this. Regular readers know I've got plenty of stuff to say about AI using Spring, and that'll be fine. I'll talk about it more next week, which will be the day before I'm giving the course. See how it goes. Next section. There's apparently a place called American Dialect Society. I'd never been to that. It looks like this. ADS, American Dialect Society. And well, spoiler alert, there's the word of the year. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. I'm still not comfortable saying that out loud. I, it's not that I never use profanity. I mean, I use it when I'm coding, obviously, you know, working with computers or when I'm driving, you know, I mean, that's who doesn't. Uh, and pretty much anything associated with Roger Goodell, you know, the commissioner of the NFL, who's a classic example of an entitled jerk. You know, I can't stand the guy. But what I wanted to mention was in there, they mentioned the AI related word of the year. And I put in a link to the press release in PDF form that has a lot of that summary information. The AI related word of the year was stochastic parrot, which was made by, I think she, uh, the person who came up with that, I think her name's Emily Bender. And she did a very influential blog post. She's a professor, major inf uh, influence in the, in the industry. And she referred to a stochastic parrot as what AIs really are. They're just parroting what they've heard and they have no understanding of it at all with a bit of randomness thrown in. So as they put the definition here, it's a large language model that could generate plausible synthetic text without having any understanding of it. And that was the number of, I think, first place votes, votes overall, something like that. So I went to Dolly and said, please generate a picture of a stochastic parrot. And this is what it came up with. So I like that it came up with all those colors and then this weirdness on the side. When it rewrote the prompt, as Dali will do, it says it's a colorful parrot with a digital glitch-like appearance representing a stochastic parrot. This parrot has a combination of vibrant feathers and pixelated digital fragments throughout its body. Its eyes have a bright, almost holographic look and it's perched on a branch with a futuristic cybernetic forest in the background. Not much of a forest, but okay. So at any rate, that's, that's what I did. The other AI-related candidates in that ad hoc category were ChatGPT, that figures, or call it ChatGPT if you like, Hallucination, sure, LLM itself, or Prompt Engineer. Yeah, I think out of that group, Stochastic Parrot's the right one to go with. And I did mention the actual word of the year, which means worsening of a digital platform through reduction in the quality of service. Actually, there's a lot more to that. The implication there is that it's a platform that is in the middle between customers and suppliers. And first, it is really nice for customers to attract as many as possible. Then 
because the customers are there, it attracts these suppliers and they shift from making the platform good for customers to making it good for suppliers so that they'll be happy and stay. And once it's got both sides locked in, then it's time to start rent seeking, you know, just keep raising the prices and pull money from both sides while making the platform worse. And I think that the examples were things like Facebook or Amazon and many others, many, many others. Okay, next section. This is very brief, but I wanted to call this out. I've been meaning to mention this a few times in the last few weeks. I'm a big fan of a newsletter called JVM Weekly by Artur Skoronsky. Let me open that in another tab here. Uh, this is his newsletter. It's still hosted on Substack at the moment. And he put out a, the post at the end of the year called Everything You Might Have Missed in Java in 2023. But honestly, all of his posts are really, really good. You know, I, I do highly recommend it. And he's been kind enough to recommend Tales from the Jar Side as well, which was totally not necessary. But again, very nice. And I wanted to make sure that even though I think I mentioned him first, <laughs> I do want to return the favor. I, I do think it's quite complimentary to the things I talk about. If you're interested in Java at all, this is one of the guys to follow. Check out the newsletter. I look forward to it every time it comes out. Let's do our tweets, toots, and skeets. Oh, this was just inspired. It looks like the task is infinity plus infinity, when in reality, the student just looked turned her head to the side and went, oh, okay, you want to write your eights on the side? I'll write 16 on the side too, which is like, oh, that's inspired. That's just brilliant. And never occurred to me, you know, way better than dealing with infinities countable or uncountable. And I'm rapidly using up my knowledge of infinities. I, I was, I didn't have a font to write an Aleph naught or something like that. There's a whole series of infinities. There's a whole calculus of infinities out there. I know enough to know it exists but that's about it. I know that the real numbers are an uncountable infinity, whereas the integers are a countable infinity. That's actually the definition of a countable infinity. It's an, an infinite set that can be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with the counting numbers. I know what you're thinking. Move on. I'm begging you. Okay. This was just the very definition of irony in a post entitled, Who Did It Better? We have the New York Times saying, everyone wants your email address. Think twice before sharing it right before they go. Thanks for reading the Times. Give us your email address. Or Nature itself, an article called The Growing Inaccessibility of Science, but you can't have it until you pay $200 for a full year subscription. <laughs> That's the very definition of irony twice in very uh, different ways. Sigh. This one I called sound advice. The post on Mastodon said, that, I guess you call it a toot there, never catch snowflakes with your tongue until all the birds have gone south for the winter. Yeah, it sounds pretty clever. I, I get that. Uh, while I was writing this, we were in the midst, I'm in Connecticut in the US and New England. We were in the midst of our first major snowstorm of the year. I think we got somewhere between eight to 10 inches, something like that. I think the birds have all flown long ago. The monkey and the wrench, right? There's your diehard reference, if you will. Said, since Mastodon is an open network and not controlled by any deep-pocketed owner, it's a certainty that posts here are used to train LLMs. That's why it's important to make sure you always rutabaga, aardvark, linchpin, banana frog. <laughs> throw in the silly words, right? Just to throw off the training of the large language model. And I'm thinking, ooh, I should add some random text to my newsletters. And then it occurred to me, my newsletters are already pretty random. I don't think I have to worry about that. I did actually consider doing a demo of that retrieval augmented, no, what is it? Yeah, the, the RAG model, you know, putting in my own data and then doing a query about it. And I converted all of my newsletters to PDFs and tried to have it the model read it. And it didn't know what to do with most of it. I mean, after all, I, I jump all over the place. It's not like you can easily generalize what I'm talking about. So I guess I'm already randomizing. This was a map I saw. There's a book out on, on uh, terrible maps these days, but this was clever. People's reaction when you try speaking their language. Can I magnify this? Yes. So the red countries, it says, wow, I mean, congrats, but why would you put, oh, I'm sorry, the, the title was people's reaction when you try to speak in their language. So the red one says, wow, I mean, congrats, but why would you put yourself through this? 
<laughs> I have some friends in Poland. I can't wait to bounce that off of. Uh, another one, the the ones along the southern border here of the the northern border of the Mediterranean, south southern Europe, say, "OMG, you just said one word in my language. We're now officially BFFs." Yeah. Okay. And then the green one is, "Oh, that's cute. Let's." I think that's blue, actually. The blue ones here. Oh, that's cute. But let's speak in English, though. I went to Copenhagen and tried to try out some of my German or Dutch or whatever, and they immediately switched to English as soon as they heard my accent. <laughs> yeah, that, that fit. And then, of course, uh, France was, please don't do that. And then no reaction. Yeah. So, I mean, it in England, you know, so make of that what you will. I thought it was pretty clever. Uh, some readers of this newsletter may remember that I went to HeyGen, Hey.Gen or whatever it was, the AI tool there, and I took a couple of my YouTube shorts and I had them translated into, one was into Hindi and one was into Polish. And the thing about HeyGen is that it makes your mouth move in, in, correctly with the other language that you don't even speak. But the interesting thing was, is I when I bounced it off of native speakers of those languages, their response was, Okay, thanks for trying, but yeah, don't do that. It's like the translation's okay, but not great. It's mostly distracting. We're used to dealing with English speakers. Just speak English. <laughs> so, all right. I know. This one was As You Wish. Uh, the only remake of Princess Bride I would accept. So, of course, at this point, Wesley's the grandfather. Uh, and we've got, you know, Wesley is the is Kermit. Buttercup is Miss Piggy, of course. And then there's assorted members here. You can evaluate how much you believe. I like that the mouse down here was the rodents of unusual size. That works. I'm not sure how Rolf the dog becomes the albino, you know, but okay. But that woman who yells boo is apparently her credits in the movie are ancient boo-er, and that's animal. Yeah, that worked for me too. And of course, you know, the, the doctor as the professor there is uh, Miracle Max. I guess I'm talking myself into it. I'm just having trouble seeing Fozzie as Vincini. <laughs> or, you know, whatever that character is, is Humperdinck. I, I don't know. So, at any rate, I thought it was pretty clever. Regardless, I would definitely watch that. I would definitely watch that. Okay, paradoxical. This is, oh, wow. And in goes the guinea pig and comes out and it says half off haircuts and they only got one half. So they went back in and now they got half of the half. I said, this is going to take forever. Yeah, the good old Zeno's Paradox. I assume that the barber's name was Zeno or the barber shop's name was Zeno's or something like that. What's the mouse over here say? Oh, it's just uh, printing the text from the uh, image. So I copied that from uh, Mastodon. Okay, lookalikes. When you look just like the painting, and yes, lower, upper left corner, upper right corner, lower left corner, and wow, what a resemblance in the lower right corner. Resembles is almost frightening. Yeah, I'm going to move on. I don't tweet much anymore. I don't use Twitter very much, but I retweeted that. Yeah. If you choose to unsubscribe, you get what you pay for. I understand. Okay, uh, this one. Now it all makes sense. This was another post. This one's making the rounds this week, too. SpaceX executives worried Elon Musk was on drugs during cringeworthy all-hands meeting, according to the Wall Street Journal. Musk's drug use, which includes LSD, cocaine, ecstasy, and ketamine. I've heard about the ketamine abuse. According to people familiar with the matter, is at the center of an extensive new report from the journal who doesn't write things without sourcing them pretty carefully. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with their editorial policy on lots of stuff, but their reporting, you know, they have a very good reputation for that, and they knew this was going to get attacked. At any rate, that details how executives at several of the billionaire's companies have struggled to, ma to manage his substance use and erratic behavior. So I took the links, one from Business Insider and one from the Wall Street Journal, and put them separate just in case you want to follow up on that. Of course, Elon said nothing for a while and then attacked the news integrity of the Wall Street Journal, which that's only going to be making the spread more widely. Yeah, I think the guy's headed for a major fall. I mean, if he he controls so much stuff that when he stumbles at all, it makes the news. And you can't be on that many drugs with so many people so happy to supply you. Info. He's not going to run out of money, but he'll do something chaotic and it's going to be an ugly crash when it happens. And finally, at last, a pie chart nobody could argue with. 
the blue section says, can I magnify that one actually? Yeah, there we go. The blue section says sky, the yellow is the sunny side of the pyramid, and the brown is the shady side of the pyramid. And yeah, it is. I mean, what are you going to say? Very good. So have a great week, everybody. This week, I've got a reactive spring and spring boot course in the APAC time zones on the O'Reilly platform. And Thursday morning, I'm doing my regular managing your manager course. If you happen to be there, please let me know and say you're a jarhead. And otherwise, I'll see you next week. And let's play that theme song. So take hey, care, everybody. Hey, best. It's time to tune in to Tales from the Jar. So let's begin. Shall I come in and spring on my Creepy grass and don't be shy Tales from the jar side Oh yeah! Crack up in the cold, let's take a ride From design patterns to the latest trends Your weekly tech post that never ends